been quite a 10 years, hasn't it? Quite a journey we've been on, and it's hard to imagine uh, that we're 10 years old. The last 10 years has just been this unbelievable adventure of just faithfully putting one foot in front of the other over and over as God led us places we couldn't imagine. And hopefully you've enjoyed the trip down memory lane. I know one thing, our videos have gotten a little better, uh, but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed recreating and remembering uh, some key moments from the last 10 years of Ransom's history. Uh, before we jump into the message, I want to make an introduction. Up here with me is uh, Reverend Bill Kanayan, and the reason he's up here uh, is, well, I mean, lots of reasons, but Bill was my pastor uh, growing up, particularly from the eighth grade on. He's my friend. He's been a mentor over the years, but most importantly, the reason he's here today is that he was the senior pastor at Linwood Wesleyan Church 10 years ago as he led them as a church to partner with Steph and I and eventually with Phil and Natalie to plant the Ransom Church. They were our mother church. So if it weren't for this man standing in front of you, uh, Ransom Church wouldn't even exist today. So if you appreciate that, let him know. Uh, what you may not know is that 10 years before he did that for us, Linwood did the same thing for Celebrate Church, and so this man's obedience has led to nearly 8,000 people going to church on Sunday at, on, at, at churches, yeah. Uh, and, and it's led to, to thousands of salvations, thousands of baptisms because of his willingness to listen to the Lord and follow the call to plant churches, and churches that when he prayed about it, God told him would be bigger than any church he would lead. Think about that humility. And so we chose to bring Bill and his wife Donna here today to say thank you, to honor them in the smallest way, uh, for making choices, for making sacrifices that we can never repay, and to celebrate their legacy as kingdom multipliers. And so we had this, uh, this plaque made uh, that just says, in, appreciative, in appreciation to Bill Canaan, the Ransom Church celebrates 10 years of ministry and your legacy and multiplication. And it has a, a scripture uh, and a, a key on here because what's so important is when Jesus talks about giving the keys to the kingdom, right? And how he entrusts us with them, but then we need to entrust others. And, and Bill has done that. And so we want to give this as a gift to honor Bill and Donna for their legacy of multiplication. Thank you guys so much for all you've done for us. And I've given it to you three times. This time you get to keep it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but no, uh, I asked Bill to do us a, a, a favor and just uh, take two minutes, a minute or two, and just share one encouragement. I, I asked him, Bill, if you could, as we turn 10, if you could give us one word of encouragement as we're now on the other side and we're getting ready to send to plant churches, what would you tell us? So what do you have for us, Bill? Well, Donna and I are very honored to be here. Um, I feel like uh, my participation in all of this is overplayed. I don't feel worthy of this. But there were, you know, God spoke to me about doing church planning. And what he was calling me to do was being willing to give away people, to give away money. But God called on other people, called on Phil and Stephanie to leave a wonderful ministry they had at Mitchell to come to Sioux Falls and do this. And God spoke to Phil and Natalie. And Phil at that time was uh, in a full-time staff position with me at Linwood. And he gave that up to become a volunteer at the Ransom. And that was a, he was a hero to me for that. And God raised up and called on people, lay people, to step in and, and in that movie theater every Sunday to get in there and set it up, every Sunday to tear it down. People who did set designs and set those up, tear those down. Children's workers, greeters, ushers, uh, coffee makers. I mean, it was just all those people God called on to do something. And, and I'm just one of many that God spoke to and said, do something. And what I have in common with some who are in this room and many others who, who launched this thing was just a willingness, willingness to say, yes, God, do something. And here we are 10 years later, and I've been out of town for eight years, and I get to come back and see what God has done. You know, some plant, the Bible says, and some water, but it's God who gives the harvest. And God has done this, and it's amazing. And so my word of encouragement to you is be willing. I wonder what is going to start now that 10 years from now you can look back at and say, I had part in that. And, and look at what God has done. God wants to use you. God wants you to be willing. All you have to do is say yes. 
and great things happen. I want to pray over Bill. Uh, Bill's still, uh, he's pastoring in Michigan right now, and uh, we're still benefiting from him. Uh, if you've met Pastor Kelsey from West Campus, uh, she's on our staff now. She's a product of Bill's leadership, his church in Michigan. So we continue to be blessed uh, by this man. And, and I just want to pray, uh, send him off with a prayer blessing over him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I just thank you for Bill and Donna for their legacy. Um, he, he calls it overplayed. It, it's not overplayed in my life, Lord. Um, had he not taken the risk on me, um, who knows? Who knows? But we're here and we're celebrating his willingness to take that risk. And as we now send others out and take that risk, I pray uh, that we can be as half as courageous and uh, as half as bold as, as Linwood was all those years ago. Uh, would you continue to bless Bill and his ministry, uh, bless Bill and Donna and their marriage, uh, their kids who are grown now and, and their, their family, uh, and will not fail to give you the praise because we know you're just getting started. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's give Bill one more hand. Well, by now, you're probably aware we're doing a top 10 series uh, from the last 10 years of Ransom's history. We're, we're going back over old uh, series, but as exciting as it has been to look back, I don't want to do that today. I want to look forward because I'm convinced God is just getting started. Amen? Uh, and so you may uh, be newer to us. You may not realize this. Maybe you just started attending. You are part of something much bigger than yourself. We are focused uh, not just on adding to a local church. We're focused on uh, we are driven by a passion to multiply the kingdom. And even though we want you, if you're newer here, we want you to feel at home here. Make no mistake, this is not a safe place. Uh, and you might be thinking, wait, isn't church supposed to be safe? Well, of course, we want you to feel safe when you are here. And we go out of our way to, to take extra precautions to make sure that you can worship free of inhibition and this will be safe for you. We also want you to feel safe as in embraced and accepted here. We, we want this to be a place that's safe, whatever you believe, to explore this thing called Jesus Christ and, and faith in him and, and the fact that he might actually be the way, the truth, and the life. And, and so wherever you are in your journey, we want you to feel safe being on that place and, and, and journeying towards him. So what do I mean when I say the ransom's not a safe place? Here's what I mean. It's good for a church to be safe, but it's bad for a church to play it safe. Paul tells us uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. In other words, we're in a spiritual battle. I mean, the reality is there is a war raging right now for every soul. There is a real enemy. His name is Satan. He's not made up. He's, he's real, and he's fighting for every single person. He's trying to get you to never find freedom in Christ. He doesn't want anybody to find that freedom. And, and the thing with a safe church is, whether they mean to or not, safe churches tend to avoid battles. And this is a battle. And maybe you grew up in that kind of a church where there was just kind of no vision, no passion, no life change. You're never challenged. You're never pushed. You're never convicted. Uh, you're never for, you know, put, you know, encouraged to be out in your community. Uh, you're never encouraged to be outside the four walls of the church. And safe churches tend to strive to keep members happy because you don't want to rock the boat. Safe churches tend to avoid controversial issues because you don't want to make people mad, and safe churches tend to remain cautious because we've always done it that way, or we've never done it that way, and the problem is safe churches aren't part of God's plan. They're not a threat to the enemy. They're not a threat to anyone or anything unless dying of boredom is a threat, and then they're lethal, and so we don't want to be a safe church. No church wants to be a safe church, but we mean it when we say we're not interested in playing it safe. And we've actually done our best over the last 10 years to keep taking God-sized risks that we feel that we're being called to. In fact, as I look back over the last 10 years, the only ministry regrets that I have in the last 10 years are the times where we chose to play it safe, but I knew God was telling us to take a God-sized risk. Erwin McManus years ago wrote a book called The Barbarian Way where he challenged this idea of safe Christianity. Here's what he wrote. He said, I want to destroy the influence of the Christian cliche, the safest place to be is in the center of the will of God. The cost to participate in the mission of God is nothing less than everything we are and everything we have. It's hard to imagine that Jesus would endure the agony of the cross just to keep us in line. And if you don't believe that's true, talk to any one of our residents in our Awaken program, and they will tell you the center of God's will is crazy. But this is the call of God to be a dangerous church, and it's what we want. We want to be a church that's dynamic, that's not dying. We want to be a church 
filled with kingdom-focused risk-takers and kingdom-focused disciple-makers. We want to be bold. We want to be unshakable in our faith. And by we, I don't know if you know this, I mean you. <laughs> like, we want you to be that church. And we would love for everyone in here to be able to say, I have a heart that breaks for the broken, that loves people no matter how broken. We want everyone in here to be able to say, I would be willing to do anything short of sin to reach people. And whether or not you are naturally excited about being a risk taker or not, I'm guessing everyone in here, at least on some level, is, wants to be obedient, right? Believers in this room, my guess is you want to obey, that your desire is to do what's pleasing in God's sight. You're trying to obey him. Those who are not yet believers in Jesus, maybe you're here exploring, but if anything's holding you back, a lot of times it's the realization that in order to follow God, like to truly follow him, I got to live in obedience to him. And so there's this understanding by and large that obedience is a huge part of this. So it might surprise you a little bit to find out what constitutes obedience. Did you know risk taking is precious in God's sight? He treasures it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, if you will. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, uh, you can raise your hand. The ushers are coming around with Bibles and smiles, and they'd be glad to give you both. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please keep it. It's our gift to you. Uh, we want you to have it. Or if you want to follow our notes online and fill them out online, they used to be on the Bible app. They're now in the Ransom Church app. Uh, you can go there, and our, our fillable notes are there as well. Uh, we're, move, we're a little more limited on time than usual because of some extra elements in the service, so I want to dive right into the text. This parable, this story is told by Jesus to give insight into the value that God placed specifically on risk. So let's look at Matthew 25, starting with verse 14. Jesus writes, again, the king, or he's, he t says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. So Jesus would tell these stories to explain the kingdom of God, and the parable of the talents is one of those stories for certain. The characters are to represent different people to us and make us think of different people. Do you know who the rich guy who goes away is? That's Jesus, okay? And, and what we learn by looking at, at this description of this guy, uh, and it is astounding what we learn about Jesus. The first thing we learn is that Jesus would make a lousy banker. And here's what I mean. Banks are required by law to keep a certain percentage of funds back. It's known as the reserve requirement. But in this story, it says the master, that's Jesus, entrusts his money to his servants. And the Greek word here indicates his very existence, the essence of himself. In other words, he trusted them with everything. He didn't keep a reserve, okay? He risked it all. So if these servants were to decide, we're just going to run off with the money, the master could be completely ruined. But that was the risk he thought was willing to take. Now, the New Living Translation uses the phrase bags of silver. In the Greek, it's the word talents. A talent was, we think of talents, we think of like being able to tap dance or you know, do the baton or whatever. Uh, but a talent was originally a unit of weight, and then it came to refer to a unit of money. And most sources would say a talent would be understood to be uh, roughly 6,000 denarii. And a one denarius was equal to one day's wages. So what you're talking about here, a talent would take a, a average day laborer 20 years to earn. I mean, it's a lot of money, right? Uh, according to uh, today's minimum wage standards, it would be roughly $500,000. So the master gives $500,000 to the first guy, a million dollars to the second guy, two and a half million dollars to the third guy. That's a lot of money. And it gives us a hint into the character and the lavish love of Jesus that he pours out. He himself is taking a great risk on us. And he's also leading, it by example, in risk, okay? The second thing we learn is that Jesus really was going on a long trip, okay? He was well aware when he told this story that within a matter of weeks, he would have been crucified, buried, raised from the dead, and would have ascended to heaven and would be at the right hand of the Father and that he was gonna be gone for a while, at least in human perspectives, a while, okay? He also knew that he was going to return someday and that we are going to give account before God of how well he managed what, or we managed what he gave us. Do you know that? That you're going to stand before God and he's going to go, what'd you do with what I gave you? The third thing we learn is that Jesus isn't fair, at, at least not in the, the standards that we think of. He didn't distribute things equally. 
It says the master distributed uh, the money according to each person's abilities. We, we talked about this before. We need to embrace this concept. It's not the same for everybody. Some received more and, and some received less. But listen, everybody received enough to do what God called them to do. You're not required to do what God called somebody else to do. You're required to do what you're required, what you're called to do, but you are required to do it. You're required to, to surrender that all. And by the way, we're t- we know we're talking about more than money now, don't we? Yeah. This is the reality for every believer, that you're one of the servants in this story. That Jesus has left us to care for the earthly kingdom, to make disciples of all nations, and he gave us everything we need in order to do it. He gave us the time, he gave us the the resources, he gave us the abilities to make a difference. King David was actually pretty blown away by all this in the Psalms. He writes how God placed so much trust in our hands in Psalm 8. He wrote, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Now watch this. You gave them charge of everything you made, everything, putting all things under their authority. Folks, God took a huge risk on us that we would actually carry out his mission. We would be disciple makers. We would follow what he told. We would do something with what he gave us. What would you have done in their shoes? Like I, I like risks as much as anyone. I used to rock climb until I fell 60 feet and almost died and thought, probably shouldn't do that again. Uh, So now I ride motorcycles and I hang out with cat people. I'm basically living on the edge. Uh, But still, when it comes to the kingdom of God, I think in the kingdom economics, we have a tendency to play it safe. In fact, I think that we actually define and equate faithfulness with playing it safe. That it's the faithful thing to do would be to just stay in this box. But that's not what we see play out. Let's keep reading our story. Verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Now, please understand, you need to see this. Each servant did as they saw fit. In other words, they were all trying to do the right thing. No one was trying to rebel. No one was trying to do the wrong thing. They're all trying to do the right thing. Two of them by risking everything for the kingdom. One of them by playing it safe with the master's money. And the response of the master tells us so much about the character of the heart of God. Look at verse 19 following. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they'd used his money. The servant to whom he'd entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me the five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Now, here's the phrase we all want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Isn't that what we're going for? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Why? Because you've been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I've earned two more. Again, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I'll give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Do you hear it? God is celebrating their risk taking. And and don't miss that the servant number two started with way less, but the master gives them identical praise because they had identical faithfulness. But watch watch what happens to our third servant, verse 24. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Now, to me, that seems like a foolish way to start, right? But I know you're kind of a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's all of your money back. Here it is. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. What a turn. Listen, this isn't some super bad guy. This isn't some rebellious... This is a guy trying to do the right thing. There's a lot to be said for this servant. He at least understood that what he had been given ultimately was still the master's and he was just a steward see most people today we think if god blesses us with with gifts or abilities or finances or whatever that obviously it's for us to make our lives super super comfortable and it no longer belongs to god it's just about making my life better right 
it never occurs to us that maybe he gave that to us for a kingdom purpose. So at least this guy had that part down. But here's what we know about the third servant. He didn't think, he didn't work, he didn't try, he just made excuses and then attempted to call his excuses faithfulness. And the reality is we struggle with the same belief. So many believers in the church, we take what God has given us, and if we don't blow it on ourselves, we hide it in a jar, screw the lid on tight, and bury it. And again, we're talking about more than money. Mark Batterson in his book, Chasing the Lion, puts it this way. He said, I think we tend to think of faithfulness in maintenance terms, holding down the fort and maintaining status quo. We think that faithfulness is hanging on to what you have, but nothing could be further from the truth. Faithfulness isn't minimizing risk. Faithfulness is maximizing risk in order to maximize reward. In other words, God rewards those who risk it all for him. Do you understand if I stand before God someday and all I have to answer to give him back is ransom church, he's going to call me a wicked, lazy servant? You, you understand that? He's given us so much. He's poured out so much blessing, so much... You know, even those of us who feel like we don't have a lot, compared to the rest of the world, we have so much in, in the terms of money, and, and, and we have talents that God has given us, we've got gifts that he's put in us, we've got time that we could give, but we're given to something else, and he expects us to do something with it for the kingdom. You know, McManus goes on in barbarian way, he says, perhaps a tragedy of our time is that such an over overwhelming number of us who declare Jesus as Lord have become domesticated, or if you will, civilized. God's heart is broken by a civilized church. When you talk to uh, nine, people who are 95 or older and you ask them what their biggest regrets are, you hear the same thing over and over. It always comes down to, I, I didn't risk it enough. I, didn't, I played it safe. I stopped short. What, I always wonder, what if? What if I'd given my all? What if I hadn't played it safe? Certainly that applies to the kingdom. I mean, the only thing scarier than risking it all for God is living life and never risking anything. And Paul sums up the dangerous life as he recounts his own life in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's writing to Timothy and he's, he's thinking back over his ministry. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Folks, that's God's call. That's God's desire. That dangerous, we would be a dangerous church who fights the fight. That would be a dangerous church who, who finishes the race. That we'd be a dangerous church that risks it all to reach the world. God wants us to be a dangerous church, but do you understand it starts with dangerous people? And I can stand up here till I'm blue in the face talking about how important this is, but if you choose to play it safe, we'll never get there. And at Ransom, we're entering a season of great risk, but God-sized risk. For the last 10 years, I'm not, in, I'm not trying to say in any way we've played it safe. We've, we've chased the vision to set captives free, and we've seen God do unbelievable things. We've seen thousands of people dedicate their lives to Jesus and, and be set free from a host of other things that have held them prisoner for a long, long time. And as a result, yes, we've, we've had to add several campuses as well as ministries and nursing homes and, and, and the jail and online, but the majority of the risks that we have taken have been risks that affect the Ransom Church and our ministry. And, and today's a new day. Today we're entering a new season. God has been stirring us the last few years with this particular thought about Ransom's future. What if God didn't build Ransom to be large? What if he built Ransom to be leveraged? What if everything that's happened so far was in preparation, was setting the stage for what God would do both through us as a three-campus church and through each of us individually as we give ourselves away generously, as we disciple people like crazy, and as we risk everything for the sake of the kingdom? Would you say you're interested in that? Mm -hmm. I am unconvinced. <laughs> would you say you're interested in that? Because if you're not, you have chosen a church really poorly because we're never going to play it safe. I promise you, we are never going to play it safe. In our minds, it's time to awaken the church. You know, throughout history, there have been times where the church has become a sleeping giant. You know what I'm talking about? And it has taken, as you read through history, bold leaders of the faith willing to risk it all to awaken the sleeping giant again. We believe this is one of those times. 
where God wants to stir up an awakening. We don't want to just keep growing Ransom Church. We want to help awaken the church again because there's a battle raging for every soul, and by and large, the church in America isn't doing a whole lot to stop it. And that's why we're launching the Awaken program. If if you're curious about it, you want to learn more, you can visit awakenthechurch.org. Awakenthechurch.org. And you're going to find a snapshot of what Awaken is. You heard a a little bit of a description earlier on the video, but basically it's a training program for leaders that includes both a two-year ministry residency, a one-year church planner training residency, and also houses what we call our Awaken Network, which is going to be a network of churches, which is a way to help the churches that we plant stay connected because we're stronger together than we are apart. Now, as part of that movement, we've set some goals And we've been vision casting those goals. We want to see 400 disciple maker relationships this year. We're not there. We're somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 150. And there are a bunch of you sitting on the fence. 196 of you attended a training and then did not get involved. So there's 196 of you at least sitting on the fence saying, I know I should do this. This is the time. This is the time. It's time to get in the game. It's time to start discipling someone. Contact us. We want to help you. We also want to train 100 leaders to be prepared to launch churches and ministries, and we're currently working to launch those three churches you heard about. We're sending the team to Des Moines to launch Table Church. We're sending Josh Wiley and a team to Idaho to to launch Gathering 208 in Boise. But here's one I'm really excited about. We're launching or planting a church in Rock Rapids, Iowa. And we haven't talked a lot about this yet, but we're launching this church. It's going to be a, a plant that's going to operate like a campus. It's going to stay connected to us. And here's the coolest part. It's not led by some guy or gal who's had a ton of ministry training. It's being led by a couple from our church, some of you. Don and Mike Vandentop live in Rock Rapids, Iowa. Don works for an engineering firm. Mike has a carpet laying business, and together they're going to launch a church. So don't tell me you can't do it too. They're going to get into the training. Dawn is getting into our training program. We're going to get her equipped. We're going to get her credentialed in our training program. And we plan to launch sometime in the fall or the first of the year. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. But you know what might really excite you is hearing it from Mike and Dawn themselves. So watch this video. We had been attending our, our church in Rock Rabbits. And just were not, we were not being filled. We were not being filled so we could not go out and fill others. We could not, um, we would sit there on Sunday and just know that there was more to it than than what we were getting out of it. So we started to church shop. I hate using that word, but church shop. And we decided it was between the ransom and another church. Phil just has a rawness with his sermons and they're always speaking directly at you. It's like no matter what no matter what was going on in our life at the time, or our kids, because our kids were, or still are, um, coming here too. He just, he constantly is directing it right towards you. God placed it on my heart, probably about two and a half, three years ago. And I was, sounds silly, I was painting our living room, and I was listening to worship music, and God told me that he wanted me to awaken the little white church. One morning in the tech booth, Phil, Pastor Phil came up, and we were talking about stuff, and. He said, I want to say something to you. And he goes, and I don't want you to put it in a box. Um, I want want to say it. I want you to think about it. And we'll talk about it later. And he said, I want you to plant a church. And that was probably when I lost it, knowing that he was, it was right after a retreat that um, the staff had gone on. So knowing that he was feeling that, sensing that, I was feeling that, sensing that, that was probably the final straw that I knew that this is something God wanted us to do. I think it was shortly after Phil told me that he wanted me to plant a church. I shared it with our life group. Um, Explained God, you know, telling me to plant or awaken the Little White Church. Phil wanting me to plant a church and just seeing if the life group would be on board and what their thoughts were too. For the most part, they all are from the Rock Rabbits area, um, by George, Dune, the surrounding areas. And so that got a lot of discussion going with us and thought, well, we should probably look into this, find a building, see what's what's happening. One of the gals that goes there used to be from Rock Rabbits and went to this little white church in Rock Rabbits, the congregational church. And she thought they were maybe thinking about selling their building. They wanted to sell the little white church. So that is how 
the church in Rock Rabbits came about. So we are in the process of purchasing a little white church in Rock Rabbits, Iowa. I am most excited about the conversation with the people that I've had in town in Rock Rabbits and just the excitement that they have. Uh, I was texting a, a friend and she was like right away, well, when are you gonna be open? How soon is this gonna happen? It's like, well, we're gonna have to get in there, make some renovations, you know, do some things. And she's like, that's fine. She's like, I can wait. She goes, my mind needs a renovation. So just hearing, hearing how excited the people are in Rock Rabbits for this, that's, I can't wait to open the doors just to see who God, who, you know, God, God already knows what's going to happen that first day. He already knows who's going to be in that building in those pews. And I'm just so excited to see what he has planned. I still go back when we first started going to the ransom. I, I just love their saying or slogan at the time was, have you lost hope or have you not lost hope in God, but you've lost hope in church. And I just, I guess we're looking to reach those that don't feel comfortable right. going into a church building mm -hmm. setting. But we want to read so we're not out to bring people in that are going to church, but we're looking for those unchurched people that have lost hope. Leaving is gonna hurt, but knowing the reward that God has planned for you with planting this church or launching a church is gonna be greater in the end.